And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. And welcome, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. You have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo, and uh, welcome aboard, folks. Kicking off a brand new week here at the Midwest Command Center, and uh, man, it's great to be back in the saddle again. December has begun, and uh, we're going to kick off the week with a great program. As you know, you know, here at Hands On Apologetics, I try to be cutting edge in terms of uh, uh, defending, explaining the faith, new discoveries, new insights that can help us both explain and defend what the church teaches at the same time, help us grow in a greater, deep appreciation and love of Christ and his body, the church. And uh, we're going to do just that today. We're going to have William Albrecht and Father Christian Caps on. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, William Albrecht and uh, Father William, uh, Christian Caps is um, co-authors of several books that we've highlighted on the program. Almost always, they're uncovering either new manuscript evidence of certain beliefs or bringing in new translations that haven't been available in English and generally taking some very unique uh, lines of argument that you don't typically find with your uh, apologetic manuals at home. And today we're going to continue our discussion on a book that hasn't been released yet. So talk about cutting edge. Not only are you going to be privy to this information, but you're going to be the first, folks, because the, the book actually hasn't even been published yet. And yet, you as a listener, are you going to be privy to some really good insights into Peter in the papacy in Scripture and history? And so that's going to be coming up on the other side of the break. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, William and Father, uh, the uh, great dynamic duo within apologetics. And uh, they both love the early church fathers. They both love Scripture. And... Uh, like I said, I benefit a lot from their work and just listening to them. And uh, in fact, we even had uh, uh, Father Kappas on our Apocrypha Apocalypse channel last, uh, when was it? I think it was last Saturday, if I, or maybe it was Friday. No, I think it was Friday. Um, and it, he he's translating a book by a French theologian who is looking at Russian Orthodoxy and how they came up with this strange canon of theirs that actually reflects Protestantism. And uh, this is uh, sheds a lot of light into why Orthodox have even bigger Bibles than Catholics. There's a couple of books that they have in their scripture. And then you have the Rus Russian Orthodox that, that are more in line with the Protestants. And uh, we had them on. Great insights into exactly how that all unfolded. And uh, so uh, that's that was fun. By the way, you could check it out. Just go to YouTube, type in either Apocrypha Apocalypse, or you could type in just my name, Gary Machuda, on YouTube. Chances are it'll come up as a channel, and uh, you could check it out for yourself. So we're going to continue the same line, except we're not going to be talking about those seven Old Testament books that non-Catholics, uh, Protestants don't accept, but we're going to be talking about something uh, as important, namely Peter and the papacy and the roots of that. So that's all coming up on the other side of the break. On this side of the break, by the way, we're going to do what we always do. We're going to do our finding the fallacy to sharpen our critical thinking skills, and we're going to meet an early church father. Today's finding the fallacy is the argument from moderation and our early church father for today. It's actually not an individual. It's a document, and it's a document known as the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, otherwise known as the Didache. So a very, very early Christian document, important for Catholic apologetics, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history of this document. All in a few seconds, but before we do that, I want to welcome all of you to the dojo. Welcome aboard, everybody, all of you listening on radio, and of course, 
all of you watching live stream on the social media feeds. It's great to have you with us today. I also want to say hi to all of you listening on podcast. And that's right. Yeah, if you are headed to work or maybe the you have a baby crying or something that needs attention and you, you're going to miss this interview and you want to be on the cutting edge of apologetics, then you definitely want to get this program. And the way to do that is very easy. Just go to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. That is the official website for Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Just click on Hands on Apologetics and boom, you got all the programs right there. Eventually this show will be up there. It's usually up there pretty darn quick. And uh, you can share it, you can download it, tell people about it, spread the word about Hands on Apologetics. And uh, we truly appreciate that too. Uh, so um, not only that, but all our shows. And uh, you can access it all there on the um, website or our handy dandy phone app. All right. Uh, also, as I do every episode, I mentioned the official Dojo mailbox. If you'd like to send me an email, love to hear from you. My name is Gary Machuda. You can reach me at questions at handsonapologetics.com. That is questions at handsonapologetics.com. That comes directly to me, and I do try to answer them. And by the way, also enjoy uh, guest suggestions. Had several of them come in. And I'm checking them out. I'm working on it, folks. So thank you so much for your suggestions. Um, if you know somebody that is doing a bang-up job on social media explaining, defending the faith, and you'd like to give them a little bit more exposure and have them as a guest on our show, I'd love to have them on board. Just uh, send me your name, contact information, and a link to their stuff so I can check it out myself. And if they're dojo quality... I will invite them to the show, and hopefully their schedule squares with ours, and we'll have them on. Because this show, by the way, is live, and uh, so not everybody's available at this time. We don't pre-tape shows. The only thing we do is maybe some best of episodes if there's a holiday or something like that. But the recordings are always a live show, so uh, hopefully it'll square up. Um, yeah, so I think we've accomplished everything we needed to. Let's go to our Finding the Fallacy for today, which is the argument from moderation. Argument from moderation is known also as, and this is, <laughs> fallacies always have AKAs. It's also known as the false compromise argument, or the argument from the middle ground, or the golden mean fallacy. It is a fallacy that the truth is supposedly always a compromise between two opposing positions. Okay, so uh, the fallacy is that truth is supposedly always a compromise between two opposing positions, which, of course, is not true. And uh, this fallacy has a lot of steam because generally the correct answer usually is found somewhere in the middle, the uncomfortable middle. That's So you don't want to admit, jump the inference that since most of the time it's the more moderate or middle position that's true, that therefore it's only the middle position that's true, which is exactly what this fallacy does. Um, truth or falsity rests on arguments and evidence, right? It, it rests on uh, the truth claims, whether it's, it squares with what truly is. Um, not necessarily its relationship to other positions. So uh, if you run into this fallacy, you'll know how to identify it. And uh, just point that out because you could, I'm sure, think of a lot of examples where something is true, which is basically would be uh, a single mutually exclusive position. And that is our finding the fallacy for today. The argument from moderation. Let's go to our early church father for today, who is not actually an individual, but a document known as the teaching of the 12 apostles. Or it's more frequently called just the Didache. The Didache was first published in 1883 following its discovery by Philotheos Brinios, the Metropolitan of Nicomedia, where he discovered an 11th century manuscript, the Codex Herosomalatanus. I think I actually got that right, uh, which is Codex Jerusalem in Latin, uh, 1056. 
Upon its publication, it was quickly observed that large parts of this work was previously uh, been extant in quotations from other works, but it had not been recognized for what they were. For example, almost all of the Greek text of the Didache was recoverable from already known seventh book of the Apostolic Constitutions, originating in Syria in the 4th century. Since Brynios' discovery of the complete text, the numerous other finds have been made of fragmentary text and translations of the Didache and of a complete translation in Georgian. Fragments are now extant in Latin, Coptic, Ethiopic, and Syriac, along with a complete translation of Georgian and, of course, a complete Greek text as well. Current scholarship holds that the Didache, uh, portions of the Didache uh, may very well be uh, even earlier than Christianity, may be Jewish in origin. Part of the Didache comp- uh, comprising chapters 1, verse 1 through 3a, and chapter 2, verse 2, through to the end of chapter 6, it is originally a Jewish work from instruction for Gentile proselytes to Judaism, or so the hypothesis goes. And uh, it's also, by the way, the first example of a code of canon law in the church as well. I'll just throw that little factoid in. It's not in Jurgens, but uh, I've read it elsewhere, so it must be true. All right, so that is our early church father for today. The Didache, or the teaching of the 12 apostles. And coming up next on the other side of the break, we have William Albrecht and Father Christian Kappas. We're going to be talking about Peter. Stay tuned. I'm a monthly donor here in Phoenix, Arizona, retired Phoenix cop, and uh, I've met Jesse before, and um, I just want to tell you you guys were on fire yesterday, I'm Terry and Jesse, so you guys are on fire. I went to bed thinking, uh, man, what an unwinnable war, but when I got up, I listened to you guys. You know, you guys are doing good work, man, doing God's work, and keep doing it. I know it gets exhausting sometimes, but there's people out here that really need the inspiration and the evangelization that you guys are giving us, so my best to you, and I'm a, uh, Eddie Rodriguez, I'm a monthly donor and proud of it. My mom's gonna have a baby. She is? Will it be a boy? Or will it be a girl? We don't know yet, but we heard the heartbeat, and my dad said this is gonna be someone very special. You mean like being a president? Or maybe a doctor? Well, probably maybe like a singer or dancer, I think. Hello, my name is Marianne Koharski. I'm the director of Pro-Life Across America. We know that every baby is a miracle and has the potential to do great things. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance or would like to support the work of Pro-Life Across America, please call 1-800-366-7773 or visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org. Pro-Life Across America is non-political and totally educational. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877-543-3871, because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. Hands-On Apologetics. And as you know, Peter and the papacy, you know, the papacy has been uh, always a key doctrine in discussion, especially with Protestants. 
and also Orthodox. And uh, so it's important for us Catholics to know the background to the papacy, both its scriptural roots and historic roots. And I can think of two people, no one better than these two people to talk about. It's William Albrecht and Father Christian Kappas. And uh, their bios are so long. I'm not going to read them, folks, but I will tell you about two books that they co-written and published so far. One is The Secret History of Transubstantiation, Pulling Back the Veil on the Eucharist, and The Definitive Guide to Solving Biblical Questions about Mary, Mary Amongst Evangelists. And they have a brand new upcoming book on Peter, and I'll let them talk about it. And gentlemen, welcome to Hands On Apologetics. Thanks for having us. Gary, thank you for having us. And yeah, uh, we are thrilled to be here because that book that you're talking about is officially out. It is called The Complete Guide to the Papacy and the Holy Bible. It is out as of early this morning. So far, only ebook edition, but soft cover and hard cover should be available probably this evening. And the very first show that we're doing, once this has been officially released, is this one. So, Gary, thank you for having us. We're thrilled to be here with you. Wow. Well, I'm honored. Now, again, the title, just so people can jot it down, The Complete Guide to the Papacy? In the Holy Bible. That is correct. In in the Holy Bible. Excellent. So, yeah, well, hey, I am thrilled because there's only a few people who I think do groundbreaking work in apologetics. A lot of apologists are basically just repeating things that others have said or quoting other sources. But but you two, every time you look at a subject, you're, you're discovering new patristic sources, you're translating uh, new English translations, all types of stuff. So, and, Or you just have a unique take that other people haven't. And when it comes to the papacy, papacy is tr- ground that was really well tread. I mean, uh, there's been lots of very large tomes written on the papacy. So, um, William, uh, so where, where did the idea come up with to uh, address the papacy? Yeah, so we had a number of uh, topics that we thought were very important to touch upon. After we dealt with transubstantiation, which came after the Mary book, we talked about doing the papacy, and, and it really, really, we pretty much tossed a number of ideas out there. Father Coppice had a great outline in his mind, and we pretty much took it from there. It, uh, a lot of things came up along the way, a lot of projects of ours that we did together, articles that Father Coppice did and what have you. It took a little bit of time, but we got it out. People are very excited, and uh, within, uh, within 10 hours, we already have people, um, probably actually within eight hours of it being out in the market, people are already reacting very positively, and we're really happy about it. And um, Father, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I actually trying to remember how in the world we even came up with this uh, thing. I, I seem to remember um, that uh, watching William debate, because he'll invite me sometimes to uh, see him when he's debating on particular topics to make sure that he doesn't get anything wrong or critiques and those sorts of things. He's always trying to better himself. But I just kind of remember um, sometimes that um, I thought that uh, some of the debates also that he would invite me to watch and to see what I thought of the people that were either pro or against. And I would, you know, scribble something down or do a little word search in a, in a Greek word search engine. And then I just kind of found myself really dissatisfied with what I thought was the framing of the arguments and also the um, kind of the use of some of the might be called traditional pro or uh, contra arguments. I think that was kind of the genesis of just saying, well, I just need to sit down and go through all this material myself because, to be quite honest, I'm not sure exactly what I think about some of this material. And I think working with William, who always wants me to make sure that uh, we leave room not just for Scripture, but for the Fathers, is that we put together a composite text. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. And uh, yeah, like I said, from what I've heard from you two, uh, this sounds like you you take a a lot of different lines that I really haven't seen uh, taken before in terms of apologetics, or or even just uh, works on the papacy. Um, yeah, I, so I think the, the groundbreaking one would be uh, actually showing that Isaiah 22 is indelibly the mark on Jesus and on the book of Revelation when it comes to talking about keys. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that seems to be ground zero of uh, the papal arguments. And also how you, um, last episode, we talked a little bit about how 
uh, the controversy of the Judaizers and uh, the Council of Jerusalem, how that factors in with the writing of the Gospels and, uh, you know, the Petrine text within the Gospels, too. Oh, yeah. Um, to use uh, the Council of Jerusalem, which historically happens in 48, 49 A.D., as the very um, jumping-off point for the Gospel writers to be worried about what kind of schism happened between Peter and Paul, which Paul only alludes to in Galatians. So he has to clean up rumors and schisms that have resulted from that. So Paul in the 50s is cleaning up a mess that was in the late 40s, and it's a mess that spreads. We see the same mess in Corinth. We could argue that there are some hints of this in Rome. And so what we were kind of interested in is was tracing year by year um, what happens when a bishop, Paul, uh, also an apostle, but a bishop, corrects a pope, uh, even if it's on a good thing, what kind of unintended consequences that has. Of course, that's kind of a relevant topic today. Mm-hmm. And um, what we ended up finding was, yeah, you might actually win the argument, but you've got to be ready for all the collateral damage that you cause. The collateral damage is partially the Gospels being written potentially in the 60s and the 70s, if not later for John, uh, it's a response to the collateral damage that that kind of public fight caused and trying to put the toothpaste back in the bottle by reminding everybody that Jesus knew that Peter was a, a guy that can make mistakes in certain areas, even if he did not make mistakes in other areas, and uh, showing you piece by piece, chapter by chapter of Scripture, exactly how the Gospels are a response to the scandal of getting a little bit too much um, public fighting going on, even if the question is an important one, and St. Paul was ultimately right. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, of course, referring to <clears throat> Galatians 2, where uh, uh, Paul withstands Peter to his face in regards to right. eating with Gentiles, yeah. Um, so uh, since I haven't, I, I, I've been able to peek at the text, and I don't know what you want to explore in this program, uh, William, what, what what would you yeah. like to talk about? Yeah, let, let me let me today today we'll do a little bit of a um, a dive into how the enemies, or as you call them, Gary, we we really like the way you point out how hostile witnesses also do a great job of proving the faith. But let me piggyback off of um, what uh, what Father said a moment ago, and I really want to emphasize that because we found Gary that really the massive majority of people that reached out to myself. Because a lot of people email me and sometimes send messages along for Father as well. And the massive amount of people really appreciated that we took, that we tackled the connection between Isaiah 22 and Matthew chapter 16, realizing that this has been alluded to before, talked about briefly, uh, even shows have been done. But a deep dive in a book, we really had not seen it done before. People have really enjoyed that. And I want to also emphasize in the book, they're going to find that. We spent a lot of time together looking at the text and looking at the early church fathers as well. And very interestingly, we found a number of early church fathers that make this connection, recognize the connection, and um, as well as with Revelation. So I want to say that we're really excited about that. And that, to piggybacking off of that statement and then moving on to early witnesses, figures like the great St. Ignatius of Antioch, who's not a hostile witness— but the, a very early important figure, then, uh, then we do have later hostile witnesses, such as figures like great church writer, Tertullian and what have you. And we think the way they're laid out and presented in the book, people will realize that even if we, even at these hostile witnesses, they, in their hostility, prove the very thesis that we have laid out in our book. And I think that is a really, really important point. But to begin it, I would uh, I'd like to give the uh, the keys, if you will, to Father to uh, to get it going. And great, thanks, William. Um, yeah, one of the things that was a real surprise for us was that Tertullian um, seems to give us what may be among the first, if not the very first, exegesis of Matthew sixteen eighteen, among other things that he, that the book uh, records. But hmm. the most principle of which is. Imagine that uh, Tertullian's complaining about Pope St. Victor, who's writing uh, probably in the 190s. So we're, we're dealing with a second century problem. Now, Tertullian himself is reflecting on this sometime later. 
um, for example, um, in his Against Praxius, uh, and in his works Against Praxius and also on Modesty, we show, among other things, that he is complaining because the Pope is issuing um, churchwide edicts. Tertullian compares him to the pagan, not the, the later Catholic title, Pontifex Maximus, but the Pope is acting just like the, the head of Roman religion who's responsible for ritual orthodoxy in the entire Roman religion and who is responsible for um, the elections of all other pontiffs. Well, that's a very interesting thing, that Tertullian is already acknowledging that the Pope is making these decrees. And what are the decrees about? They're about binding and loosing of sins. And uh, Tertullian, as a hostile witness, says, I disagree because I have this new prophetic gift, which has recently come about because the Spirit is always working in the Church, according to Tertullian, uh, of being able to prophecy and forgive sins as a layperson, uh, as any layperson has the ability to do, because they can be directly be they can be directly inspired by the Spirit, and that Matthew sixteen eighteen, as you he's he's writing his local bishop in Africa, as you my bishop think, is not actually an institution that was given individually to the person of Peter, and then is participated by you, uh, by virtue of the keys, but rather Matthew sixteen eighteen refers to anybody that has the gift of Peter's prophecy. And I have the gift of Peter's prophecy, Bishop, so unless you can do Peter's miracles, and I can do Peter's miracles, then your jurisdiction that you and your church have long claimed from Matthew 16, 18, which comes through the Pontifex Maximus, that is through Pope St. Victor and his decree, is invalid. So once you start seeing that that is essentially what Tertullian is saying, it's shocking to see how much that sounds exactly like something that we would expect from the lips of Pope Pius IX to say. William? Yeah, great great points there, Father, and fantastic. And I think that the one thing that when, when working on this book, and we had, we had heard these quotes before, but maybe never meditated upon them, Gary. And going back to them and looking at them again, looking at them from a historic perspective and looking at them from uh, the perspective of Tertullian, who is now a full-blown Montanist has formally left the church, is no longer in the church. And his statements come across as quite shocking, but not only shocking, Gary, but to leave this cliffhanger for the audience as we're about to hit a break, we're going to see how they confirm exactly what the Catholic faith has said about the office of the Pope from the beginning. Excellent. All right. We are chatting with William Albrecht and Father Christian Kappas about the brand new book, Complete Guides to Papacy and the Holy Bible. More to come right after this. Psalm 119 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. According to St. John Paul II, being a Christian means saying yes to Jesus Christ. It consists in surrendering to the Word of God and relying on it, but also endeavoring to know better and better the profound meaning of this Word. May God grant that we always rely on His Word, read it often, and put it into practice. This is a catechetical minute from Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Just as the gestation of our first birth took place in water, so the water of baptism truly signifies that our birth in the divine life is given to us in the Holy Spirit. Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 694. The most basic elements of human life are often the actual tools that God uses in our relationship with Him. Water is one such element God has used, from the Flood, to the Red Sea, to the Jordan River. Father, you have made all things with this in mind. May we recognize these signs of your love, in creation. This has been a Catechetical Minute, from Virgin Most Powerful Radio.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. We are chatting with William Albrecht and Father Christian Kappas, talking about the brand new book, actually uh, just heading off the press, called The Complete Guide to the Papacy and Holy Bible. And uh, right before the break, we were talking about Tertullian, the notorious part-time early church father, (laughs) who uh, later became a full-blown Montanist, joined this weird sect of Phrygia, and uh, and his comments on the papacy. So, William, uh, just take it from there, I guess. Yeah, as I was saying before the break, the comments that he makes are quite shocking. He he then uh, he'll say... um, I now inquire into your opinion to see from what source you usurp this right to the church. If, because the Lord has said to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church, to you I have given the keys of the heavenly kingdom, or whatever you bind or loose on earth shall be bound or loosed in heaven, you therefore presume the power of binding and loosing has been derived to you. Uh, So here, Gary, before we, it's a little bit of a long quote, we'll stop there, but let me pause here before I hand it over to Father to add further comments. I want to note, this is perhaps one of the earliest commentaries uh, showing that the early church had this particular interpretation in Matthew 16. You'll find it in the hostile witness to show how the bishops of Rome interpreted this passage. It's being done in a hostile manner, but it shows you how that church there's only one other church that was uh, that he could be referring to here. This is a Catholic church. He's railing against them, showing that this is how they interpreted the passage. Gary, this hostile witness is, is positive towards our position and the position of our thesis. Uh, Father, anything uh, anything else to add? Richard, I can't hear Father. Uh, maybe... Yeah, I can't hear him at all. I don't know if... Um... Yeah, I'm not sure... Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? There we go. We can hear you. Yes. Yeah. The, it looks like the other interesting thing about this with Tertullian is that the new prophecy movement is something that Tertullian does not claim is as old as the apostles or Jesus. He's willing to admit that this is a new stage in the church's life, right? So... What he's railing against is, as we would say that we don't Judaize because the Old Testament has been superseded by the New, he's claiming that the old way of doing things. So for him, what the Catholic Church did in the first century and the second century, that's the old stuff. He's got the newfangled stuff, the new covenant, which is in the Spirit. So he's not even claiming that his bishop or uh, that the Pope of Rome uh, is uh, somehow... Uh, inventing something new that wasn't there, but he's chiding them for misunderstanding their traditional roles, is that the traditional roles aren't because they're bureaucratic or they're appointed to an office of the Church, as they think, but that the real source of their power and their bureaucratic roles was actually because it was the Holy Spirit that was allowing them to do miracles or to work wonders in the apostolic days, and that is what has returned to the Montanist movement. And that's the reason why they can claim to be independent uh, of the old Catholic Church's claims, because their miracles show that the Spirit has sort of resurrected the apostolic movement, which is defunct with the bureaucracy that uh, was around all the way up until the Montanism. So I think that that's a really important point. Yeah, especially in such an early date, too. (laughs) Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> to to make that distinction really does say a lot about uh, the understanding of these t- texts coming out of the first century. William, you want to add something? Yeah, uh, to really piggyback off of everything that uh, uh, Father has pointed out, uh, the very uh, – <laughs> we cover, of course, in the book uh, uh, where he refers to the Pope as the Pontifus Maximus, how um, all of these insults really – People will, will read them and, and at times not stop and realize that 
these powerful insults really are only confirming the thesis of the ancient church, that ancient Catholic church, because if Tertullian is upset that the Bishop of Rome is making these claims about himself, he has uh, the power to bind and to loose, uh, uh, the loosing which is connected with, uh, uh, Tertullian connects the loosing of sins with baptism and, and, and uh, the power of jurisdiction and all of these things, they're just so powerful, Gary, uh, to really confirm not only our thesis, but really the thesis that has been laid out by the church from the beginning, because, you know, a lot of the stuff that you're going to find in our book maybe may, might be stuff that you haven't heard before or seen laid out like this before. But the real neat thing, Gary, as you talked about uh, the Galatians 2 incident earlier, is we found a confirmation of everything that we've laid out in the fathers as well. So you're going to find a rich wealth of early church fathers, tons of quotes in the book as well. Um, Gary, just really, really happy that the book has ended up rounding out like a book that will put people on a journey of really understanding exactly what the church means about the papacy. And I think it comes at an important time where people, uh, there's a lot of confusion going around and uh, a lot of hostility. And we think that perhaps we hope Perhaps the book will will ease a lot of concerns that people may have as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So now this is from uh, this quote. Now, I can't remember where it's from. Is it from On Modest, Modesty or is it Against Praxis? Yeah, it would be uh, uh, Against Modesty, I believe. Right, Father? Yeah, we uh, we use both. Uh, yeah. The Against Praxis is important because that's Tertullian railing against Pope St. Victor, who believes that he is powerful enough to forgive the worst of sins, which in the Roman Empire at this time, Tertullian is uh, linking with adultery and fornication. And uh, when Tertullian reads 1 John about a sin that is unto death, of what we would call a mortal sin, Tertullian doesn't believe that um, anyone, even the new prophets, can forgive those kinds of mortal sins, because it leads to morally then allowing a person to just keep sinning. And so his um, railing against uh, Pope St. Victor and also his own local bishop, who has taken Pope St. Victor's decree and, and, and uh, also agreed with it in his diocese, uh, is that Pope St. Victor has to do the miracles that St. Peter did in order to have the same jurisdiction that he's claiming for himself. And so what we see in Tertullian, again, is a witness that he knows what's going on here. This is the Pope's claim to having jurisdiction over all sins, baptism, uh, sins, uh, sins and confession, uh, and even to have jurisdiction that he can grant to other bishops to, in Tertullian's thoughts, collude with him in order to actually be able to give unforgivable sins, which would be, again, adultery. Okay, yeah, yeah, very interesting stuff, uh, especially in light of, you know, his perspective. Somebody could pick up Tertullian and assume he's a Christian in good standing and say, wow, look, here's Christian evidence against the papacy. But once you realize he's already jumped ship and he's saying these things, uh, you know, then uh, that changes the whole story, doesn't it, William? Yeah, without a doubt, he really does. And I think, again— uh, the one thing that I'd like to, to, to emphasize to the audience, and we do over and over in the book, is the fact that Tertullian's very, he's clearly upset that the Pope, Pope St. Victor, believes that he has this jurisdiction, that he has this particular power. And the very fact that he lays it out over and over, mocks the Pope, even calling him the Pontifex Maximus, and he provides an incredibly early interpretation of Matthew 16. An interpretation that Catholics would utilize to this day, and we realize that he's, in essence, telling his audience, I'm a Montanist, and this is the particular interpretation that this church, the Catholic Church, has for this passage. Again, I would emphasize that is massively, massively important. And again, he's not the only hostile witness that we uh, refer to. There, there are others, but again, I love the way you pointed out a part-time church father for the audience wondering, why do we jokingly call him that? Gary coined that phrase years ago because Tertullian began his life out as one of the greatest defenders of the faith, great defender, and unfortunately, eventually formally left the church, became a Montanist, and 
did not die in the fold of the church. So today we do not honor him as a church father. Yes. Yeah, very good. And uh, yeah, a quick question for Father. I'm trying to remember, but wasn't Pope St. Victor uh, also involved with the Quattro Medesimon uh, problem where he was going yeah, to this excommunicate is a great, This the is a great point that you're making, uh, a divided Easter, that Christians yeah. that came from the background of St. John the Evangelist Church as we know, there are two different calendars that are being used in uh, the synoptic calendar and John's calendar, right? Jews mm -hmm. amongst themselves had tons of different calendars they used. So it depended on what group you belonged to with what kind of calendar you were going to use in the Jewish world. So uh, it stands to reason that with John's calendar being different, his communities that he founded had a different Easter reckoning. And um, the communities that would be Petrine, St. Victor's community in Rome, uh, had what we would consider to be our Easter, a Sunday-based Easter. And uh, basically, uh, the issue that you're, you're bringing up is a, a perfect segue, because what ends up happening is uh, Eusebius, who's also a hostile witness to, the, to this extent, um, he found that Rome was not his ally against uh, Athanasius uh, during at least Eusebius' life, and he also found that Rome was not his ally uh, during all the times in which he lived, uh, when it came to resisting Nicaea. Rome was pro-Nicaea, particularly under Pope St. Sylvester, just to use an example. Um, and so Eusebius, as the great church historian, gives us the actual documentation, which is not uh, called into doubt, where, like Pope St. Victor, um, uh, in uh, Tertullian, Pope St. Victor is again at the, at, in the middle of a controversy uh, during this period of, of probably, say, the 180s. And St. Irenaeus and a bunch of bishops have a problem with St. Pope St. Victor being too strict on the Easter dates. They think he's being pastorally imprudent by forcing uh, one Christian group to give up the ritual. Of course, that's a, that's a modern-day problem that we're having uh, nowadays. We hear about that a uh, particular ritual has been suppressed in part of the Church. And so this is a very common problem. And so what happens is some of the bishops get very angry with St. Irenaeus, uh, but Saint, I'm sorry, with uh, Saint Irene, uh, some bishops get angry with Pope St. Victor, the Pope, uh, but St. Irenaeus is the moderate voice in all this, the reconciling voice. But what's most interesting in this, just like the problem that Tertullian has with the Pope, they all remind the Pope of previous papal legislation, and that's the reason why the Pope's policy change. They look back only at their former legislation and their predecessors in order to change the policy, not because of the work of the crowd. All right. If you're listening to Hands On Apologetics, we'll be right back. Here's a great way to support Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Do you have an old car you want to get rid of, motorcycle, RV, or boat? Simply call 855-500-7433, and when they sell that vehicle, a portion of that money comes right back to support Virgin Most Powerful Radio. It's an easy way to do it. I want to thank you for it. Call 855-500-7433. God love you and your family. Logan, what has Virgin Most Powerful Radio done for you? Virgin Most Powerful Radio, I gotta say, I've been a listener for about a year now, and it's really helped me grow closer to my faith and the fact that I'm listening and I'm getting unsugar-coated, clear, charity with clarity, Catholicism. And it has really helped me even, you know, grow so much deeper in my faith as a young man and discern the priesthood and have a love for Jesus Christ. And this is so seen on the Terry and Jesse show on Virgin Most Powerful, the unsugar-coated, clear truth of our Catholic faith that is so lacking today. It's almost like the Terry and Jesse show. It's the orange juice Catholicism that's filling things up. I just need to give my shout out, my praise. I'm just so appreciative. It just really helped me. And I know, no, people want to hear this. It inspires me to want to speak it. And it inspires me to even go as far as discerning the priesthood to think I should speak this. We need to stand up for our beautiful faith. This is the unsugar coated beauty. And this is just what I've seen on the Terry and Jesse show. I encourage listeners to start donating and support this cause. It has just really impacted my life. And all I just want to give is some praise to it.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. Hands-On Apologetics. We're chatting with William Albrecht and Father Christian Kapp. It's about the brand-new book that's going to jumping it right off the press as we speak. It is The Complete Guide to the Papacy and the Holy Bible. And Father, uh, the music kind of came up, and I'm afraid we probably missed the last part of your sentence. You, when we're talking about Pope St. Victor uh, and his possible excommunicating some bishops in the East over celebration of Easter, you said that they appealed to previous legislation. So was that uh, Eusebius' appeal to previous legislation? Uh, Father, I think you have mute or... You might be mute. Yeah, I was on mute again. There we go. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Um, yeah, it has to do with both legis- uh, both Tertullian and Eusebius uh, record the same events. Basically, Pope St. Victor had two reversals in his pontificate, at least. The first one was, at first he was impressed, or Tertullian, with the Montanists, but a bishop showed up in Rome by the name of Praxius, or at least uh, a person from uh, that area. And uh, Praxius informed uh, Pope St. Victor about previous popes and how they had legislated, in so many words, against Montanism. And so his initial approval, we've seen this before, where a pope will uh, be impressed by a religious order that will present a pretty uh, good front, but then we find out that they're not all that they were cracked up to be, so he has to suppress them later. Of course, we know that Jesuits were most famously suppressed, um, and uh, other religious orders of of smaller uh, groups. And so we have a similar situation here, uh, in which the Pope initially thought that a group was solid, but then when he learned about previous papal acts and uh, basically decisions, he reversed his decision on this administrative matter. Now, Eusebius records essentially the same thing, that the bishops uh, who are practicing non-Sunday Easter, so Easter that can fall on any day of the week, when they hear about Pope St. Victor wanting to excommunicate them, Uh, It's not that they're rumbling and being angry against him. That's not moving him. Uh, What what is moving him not to use his authority is the moderate Irenaeus, whose argumentation I think William may have found, and uh, from our book, actually, which we're both kind of pulling up on the Kindle now that it's available. It's more convenient to find there. Um, And in that, Irenaeus says in his uh, uh, in his own letter, I believe, which is quoted by Eusebius. So this is layered, right? Eusebius is writing around, uh, in his first edition, somewhere around 300 of his church history. He's quoting Irenaeus, and Irenaeus is, uh, I believe, writing a letter to Pope St. Victor. Is that right, William? Yep, you're definitely correct. Um, very, very good as well. Very good point. Um, and you're right, really handy for people that may be wondering, it is available on Kindle. Very handy to be able to pull up, pull this up on Kindle as well. I believe it's the area that begins where it says, among these were the presbyters before Soter who presided over the church. And then he begins to go on and say, we mean Anicetus and Pius and Hyginus and Tel- Telesphorus. Um, that is the exact area you're referring to, right, Father, which is quoted it. in. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay, sorry about that. Yeah, and he goes forward to say, they neither observed it themselves, nor did they permit those after them to do so. And yet, thought, and yet, though not observing it, they were nonetheless at peace with those who came to them from the parishes in which it was observed. Although this observance was more opposed to those who did not observe it, but none were ever cast out on account of this form. But the presbyters before you who did not observe it sent the Eucharist to those of the other communities who observed it. And when the blessed Polycarp was at Rome in the time of Anicetus, and they disagreed a little bit about certain other things, they immediately made peace with one another, not caring to quarrel over this matter. For neither could Anicetus persuade Polycarp 
not to observe what he had always observed, with John the disciple of our Lord and the other apostles with whom he had associated. Neither could Polycarp persuade Anicetus to observe it as he said that he ought to follow the customs of the presbyters that had preceded him. But though matters were in this shape, they communed together and Anicetus conceded the administration of the Eucharist in the church to Polycarp manifestly as a mark of respect. And they parted from each other in peace both those who observed and those who did not, maintaining the peace of the whole church. Yeah, this is a this is a great quote because it shows that what swayed the popes to change their policies on things and day to day matters, which in many cases is what we call the third level, the lowest level, or the uh, ordinary magisterium, mm-hmm. is when they learned that they had previous legislation which had not excommunicated these uh, non-Sunday Easter observers. And so what we end up having here is a great hostile witness, meaning Eusebius, who is telling us that it is not the bishops who are uh, being rebellious that caused the Pope to change his policy, but it's the bishop who is moderate, who is respectful, but who also has documents that show that the Church of Rome's position on these things was administratively A, and that Victor was getting ready to go to position B, and so he wanted to be consistent with his predecessors. And so this falls very well with where the Church has been for a very long time in these delicate matters, which is to make a distinction between this day-to-day administration and matters of faith, which have to do with a person's eternity and also the truth in it that is eternal. Uh, in heaven, which we, of course, we call dogma or extraordinary magisterium. But what we find here in both hostile witnesses is the fact that what really gets popes to change themselves in the ancient church isn't the opinion of the masses, but is as a result of what they understand their predecessors through documentation and proofs have done, which they felt unable to go against precedent. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and a very important distinction, too. And this is something, uh, don't for those listening, don't get confused over because we're talking about the date of celebration of Easter, which is mm-hmm. what we call uh, just tradition or custom, right? Mm-hmm. It's not sacred tradition like whether or not Jesus rose bodily from the dead. That's that's not what the controversy is over, is, is when do we actually celebrate it? And so, uh, you know, this doesn't touch on doctrine, but nevertheless, I I think that's an excellent point that uh, the the Pope does look for guidance from previous popes and and their um, their actions as as pontiffs. Yeah. Interestingly enough, and and people for for people wondering, uh, very good points that have been brought up here. I'd like to point out that. At times, people wonder, well, why is Eusebius a hostile witness? Well, we note that, if I'm correct, um, at the very beginning, he, he did not want to sign uh, on at Nicaea. So Eusebius definitely does fall into the category of being a hostile witness as well. Um, we know that through history. Tertullian, we would probably put it as an extremely hostile witness there. Uh, so we, we've got more in the book. I'd like to let the audience know. Um, uh, that we're thrilled that we were able to talk about these particular figures. There are more. We also cover origin and depth. And for people wondering, we, we also cover a lot of early church fathers. But really, I, I think the important thing here that of what we just examined is, number one, we, we've seen that uh, the Pope intervening in dioceses it was something that was quite common in the early church. It was done more than once. And we look at it, when we look at Irenaeus, we see very, very clearly this model that has been laid out as our main thesis throughout the whole book is also confirmed in a second century witness. A very positive one in the great St. Irenaeus, who is a bishop, who, who was the bishop and doctor of the church, by the way. He is now uh, a doctor of the church. So the, the amazing thing I'd like to point out, Gary, and I'll let Father uh, get the final word, is that we laid out a thesis in our book, which, by the way, later on we'll talk about more chapters in the book, but we lay out a particular thesis in the role of St. Peter and the successors of Peter, uh, but in Scripture, the role of St. Peter in particular. And very early on, we tackled patristic witnesses and hostile witnesses as well, and we see that right away 
very early in church history, the very thesis, the very faith of our fathers, if you will, is being confirmed in the early church. And I think that's the most important point we really, really have to hammer home. Yeah, very good. So how far uh, into the patristic period do you, you go in the book? Well, uh, William is uh, really the one that was uh, responsible for most of the patristic stuff, but uh, we certainly uh, decided to cut it off at the Third Ecumenical Council in 680 AD, but William can maybe uh, talk about what he uh, uh, spent the most time on, which was, I think, in that period between 680 and where I left off my own patristic stuff, which was origin. Yeah, without a doubt. So we, we kind of cut it off right there. Although we do touch upon a few figures that uh, that come a little bit after that, but we kind of cut it off there. We really put a lot of emphasis, Gary, on looking at what the ecumenical councils have to say. Okay, well, uh, what do they have to say? The fathers east and west. We look at uh, uh, Pope St. Agatha. We, look, we give considerable attention to the case of Pope Honorius. That is given considerable attention in the book. And um, Father, I want to I say that uh, when, when we were working on that, Father, Father's incredible examination of Sophronius, a lot of people ignore him, also present there in the book. But you're going to find a lot of early church fathers beforehand. You're going to find a lot of information from the early church councils. And here's the amazing thing I really want to hammer home, Gary. Some of these ecumenical councils we quote from are quoting directly from Scripture that we analyze in the Bible, Beautiful. and they're providing the exact reading that we give in Scripture. And I think that's something really, really incredible. Oh, yeah. That's huge when you can show Scripture, uh, early church fathers, and hostile witnesses all cohere, pointing to the same point. I mean, that's incredibly powerful. Incredibly powerful. Um, yeah, so we're coming up on the end of the show. Uh, where can people get a copy of The Complete Guide to the Papacy and Holy Bible. Right now, they can find it on Kindle Edition on Amazon. It will be available before the end of the day, soft cover and now hardcover as well. And we promise you, people that are in Europe and other places, we are working on getting it on Book Depository and many other places. Be patient. This week, it'll be available pretty much everywhere. But right now, if you've got Kindle or Kindle Unlimited, you can begin reading it right now. The way we are, we're going through it on our very own Kindle. So we hope people are edified by it, and we hope they love it. Oh, I'm sure they will. I mean, this is all of your books. Uh, you two Thank have you. done tremendous work in this field uh, on transubstantiation and Mary, and now the papacy. Uh, it deserves to be on every apologist bookshelf for sure. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on Hands on Apologetics. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having us. All right. That's uh, William Albrecht, Father Christian Kappas. Yeah, pick up a copy. The Complete Guide to the Papacy and the Holy Bible. Uh, you won't regret it. So you, There's going to be insights that you never considered before. And as always, you know, wherever we have William on the show, the hour flies. And uh, we're already at the end. Coming up next, High Impact Catholic Talk to me with Terry Justice Joe. Thank you so much for listening. God willing, see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.